Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And in this module, we were discussing about the affinity chromatography. And in the previous lecture, we discussed about the basic principle of affinity chromatography. What are the de uh, determinants are playing crucial role by bringing the uh, receptor and the ligand together. And we have also briefly discussed about the different types of matrix, what you can use. So, in a typical matrix, what you have is you have the coupling of the receptor or the ligand to the matrix and then you can use the couple, the uh, cognate uh, pair. For example, in the case of matrix, you can couple the ligand or in the case of ligand, you can couple the matrix to the protein of your interest. Uh, and then subsequently you can be able to utilize them into the purification utilizing the affinity chromatography. So now in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the different aspects related to the generation of the receptor or the ligand and how you can be able to couple them to the matrix with the help of the different types of the chemistry uh, what is being developed to couple the uh, ligand or the matrix to uh, ligand or the receptor to the matrix and how you can be able to utilize them for purifications. So as we can have discussed uh, last time that the receptor or the ligands are actually are the making a pair because the receptor or the ligands are sharing the several interactions. For example, you have uh, the first thing is the receptor is having a three dimensional conformation which is exactly complementary to the ligand. So, this ligand is going to fit into this receptor and then you have the other kind of interactions like the hydrogen bonding, Van der Waal or the pi pi interaction and in the uh, some cases you may have the salt bridges interaction between the receptor and the ligand. And now if you want to design the affinity chromatography and would like to purify the uh, protein or the analyte of your interest, you have the two choices. Either you can use the receptor or to the ligand to make the pair with the matrix which means you can couple the ligand or the receptor to the matrix and if you use the receptor to be coupled onto the matrix then you are going to produce the protein along with the ligand. Similarly, if you couple the ligand to the matrix then you are going to generate the protein to the receptor okay. So that the receptor and ligand are going to make the interactions. Now, the question comes under what conditions you are going to prefer to use the uh, ligand or the matrix. The sole purpose of any chromatography technique is to make the purification as easy as possible as economically viable which means it is uh, should not be very very uh, uh, costly to perform and the other parameter is that it should not require the extensive infrastructures. So, in many cases, uh, whether you use the receptor or the ligand depends on the considering these parameters. So, in few cases, you are going to couple to the ligand or in few cases, you are going to couple to the matrix, uh, the receptor to the matrix. Now, uh, let us discuss how you can be able to generate the receptor or the ligand and how you can couple them to the matrix so that you can be able to utilize them into the uh, different types of chromatography techniques. For example, whether it is a bioaffinity chromatography or the pseudo affinity chromatography. So, generation of the receptor, although we are saying the generation of the receptor, but it is more or less like the receptor or the ligand, which is very, very the same thing actually. Uh, so, the receptor molecule present onto the matrix can be produced either by the genetic engineering, isolation from the crude extract or in the case of antibodies, it is produced in the mouse or the rabbit model and purified. So, you have the three options to generate the receptor or the ligands. 
you have the genetic engineering so you can actually genetically clone the gene which is responsible for a particular type of receptor and that is how you can actually and then subsequently you can purify that receptor by using the recombinant DNA technology you can put some tag or some other kind of features and then you can be able to purify the receptors using the other chromatography techniques. Uh, the other option is that uh, if the, the protein is not or the gene is very difficult to clone or it is not. Uh, been isolated so far, but the protein is available, then you can be able to isolate the protein from the crude extract. That can be done simply by either using the conventional uh, chromatography techniques like uh, ion exchange chromatography or gel filtration chromatography or hydrophobic interaction chromatography or that can also be done by the antibodies which means suppose I want to uh, make the you know insulin receptor uh, uh, or I do want to isolate the insulin receptor. So, I have two options either I will break open the cells, I will uh, prepare the lysate which is actually going to contain the insulin receptor and then I will go with the fractional uh, you know the fractionation of that particular lysate with the help of the different types of chromatography techniques uh, ion exchange chromatography, hydrophobic interaction chromatography, gel filtration chromatography and then ultimately I am going to get the pure insulin receptor. The second option is that I can just use the antibodies which is directed against the insulin receptor and then I can just uh, take out the insulin receptor from the crude mixture uh, and that is how I can uh, get the receptor and that can be used for subsequently to for the other affinity chromatography techniques. For example, I can use the insulin receptor to simply purify the insulin from the blood. The third is that you where the places where you are actually going to use the antibodies. So, antibody is actually making a pair with antigen. So, uh, you can be able to generate the antibodies which is maybe against any receptor or ligand or you know. So, it can be generated against the antigen. See the recombinant DNA technology, the genetic engineering and the isolation is already what we have discussed or the genetic engineering is what we have discussed uh, in, the, in the other courses. So, we are going to discuss about the generation of the antibody. Now, the generation of antibody is a multi-step process where you are first thing what you require is the antigen. So, antigen is the uh, is a proteinaceous substance which is actually be present uh, which is uh, the external agents or it is something which is going to cause the immune response into the particular animal uh, or the animal. Uh, so, antigen could be immunogenic or the non-immunogenic. So, the antigens which are non-immunogenic are called as the hapten. So, in those cases where you are uh, working with the antigen which are coming into the category of hepten, for example, the drug molecules. So, if you are trying to generate the antibodies against the, uh, for example, the uh, aspirin. So, if you are trying to generate the antibody against the aspirin or the chloroquine or artemisinin or any other uh, paracetamol. In those cases, the antibody is not going to be developed or these molecules are non-immunogenic or they are not going to cause any immune response into the animal. So, because of that, they are fall under the category of the hapten. So, in those cases, what you are going to do is you are actually going to uh, convert a hapten into a immunogen simply by coupling that to a protein and because of that, the the hapten is also going to be convert into a immunogenic molecule and then that complex can be used as a uh, antigen and that complex can be prepared or can be used to immunize the animals. Irrespective of whether you are working with the hapten which has been converted uh, by coupling it to a protein to a antigen or you have the natural antigens which are the protein of very very high molecular weight uh, then process these antigens uh, so that they will be 
good enough to uh, you know immunize the animals. So, we will discuss that what are the different procedures or the processes you have to do when you want to uh, process the antigens so that it, it will be ready for the immunizations. And then you are going to immunize the animals with the help with these antigenic preparations. And once the animal is going to be immunized, it is going to be immunized two times. One is the you are going to put the primary injections and then you are going to give the booster injections. And that actually is going to create or develop the antibodies into the animal. Once you antibodies are being developed, you can be able to collect the blood of the animal and then from the blood you can be able to collect the serum and then from the serum you can be able to purify the antigen or uh, purify the antibodies. At this stage where you are actually going to see the antibodies in the blood, you can be able to detect these antibodies because then only you will be deciding whether I should give the additional booster dose or whether I should just go ahead with the, this particular level of antibodies in the blood and start collecting the blood. So, that is the whole scheme through which you can be able to generate the antibodies in the animal. So, let us summarize this. First you have to do is we have to prepare the antigen. So, whether the antigen is the hapten or the proper antigen which is like a bigger proteins. If it is a hapten you have to couple that to the protein so that it will become the uh, protein like protein drug complex and that is also going to be processed for the antigenic uh, preparation so that it will be ready to be uh, given for, for the injections into the animal. And once you are going to immunize the animals, you are going to immunize the animal two times. One is the primary injections and then the secondary injections. With the help of the primary and the secondary injections, you are going to generate the antibodies. Then you are going to test the antibodies with the help of the ELISA. And once you see that the antibodies are being developed with the help of the ELISA, then you are going to collect the large quantity of the blood from the animal and subsequently you are going to collect the serum from the blood and that blood serum is going to contain the antibodies. So, you can be able to purify the your antibodies or the antibody which you have developed against this antigen and that you can use subsequently into the affinity chromatography. So, let us discuss these procedure in detail. Uh, so, the first is the preparation of the antigen. So, the antigen required for the development of polyclonal antibody is approximately 2 milligram. It is required for the multiple injection to induce the robust immune response and the preparation of antigen has the following steps. The first is that you have to generate or the produce the antigens. So, do you have the two options. One, you can use the recombinant DNA technology which means you can actually be able to clone the antigens and that that is how you can be able to produce the antigen in large quantities and purify. The second option is that you can be able to isolate the antigens. So, there are two different approaches to isolate the antigen from the E. coli overexpressing cells. For example, you can purify the antigen under the native conditions. So, even if the antigen is being produced by the recombinant DNA technology, the isolation of the antigen is having the two options. One is that the purification of the antigen under the native conditions where what you are going to do is you are going to over express the antigen into the E. coli expressing cells and then you can be able to perform the different types of column chromatography to purify the antigens. So, under these conditions the antigen is going to be functionally active and that can be used for immunizations. The second is that the isolation of antigen under the denaturating conditions which means so there are that what happen is in some cases the antigen what you are over expressing the E. coli is not soluble which means it is not present in the supernatant and because of that this antigen cannot be purified utilizing the conventional chromatography techniques. So, in those cases you are going to isolate the antigen under the denaturating conditions. The second is 
sometimes the antigen uh, is very very uh, produced in a very very small quantities so if you use the conventional chromatography you are actually going to lose the uh, protein at every step for example i think we have discussed that in the previous lecture that if even if you use a conventional chromatography the uh, you might lose more than 50% protein so if your protein production in the e coli cells is very very low uh, and you are using the conventional chromatography techniques uh, the the overall yield is going to be so low that you will not be able to get the enough quantity of the antigen to immunize the animals so under any of these conditions you can be able to purify the antigen under the denaturating conditions because even if you have a protein which is present in the native conditions or the denaturating conditions the overall immune response does not vary because even if you have a protein under the uh, native conditions it is going to be denatured while you are going to process it for the injections so uh, it does not it hardly matters. So, in the isolation of antigen under the denaturating conditions what you are going to do is you are going to do the electro elutions of the antigen from the SDS page. So, let us see how you can be able to isolate the antigens from under the denaturating conditions using the electro elutions. So, isolation of antigens from the SDS has the multiple steps. The first is that you are going to get the antigens over expressing cells then you are going to prepare the lysate and then this lysate has to be resolved onto the SDS page. So, in this case you are not going to use a mini uh, SDS gel, what you are going to use is a very large SDS uh, page so that you will be able to load somewhere around 2 to 5 ml of lysate. Normally in a typical SDS page what you load is somewhere around 10 to 50 microliter whereas in this case we are going to load 2 to 5 ml of lysate so it is going to be a big gel and uh, so you have to run a maxi prep gel so uh, so this is going to be on a maxi prep gel and then what you have to do is you have to identify the region of your interest which means if you run the sds page you are going to get different types of bands and then you have to identify the region where your antigen of interest is present and then what you have to do is you have to cut this region and bring out uh, the protein band. So then you have to cut the protein bands. Once you got the protein band which is present in the uh, gel slice you will be able to do the electro elutions and in the electro elution what you are going to do is you are going to take this gel block put it into a dialysis bag and then you put it into a beaker okay and the in the beaker you are going to add or you are going to perform the electrophoresis so you are going to connect put the positive and negative electrode across this beaker so what will happen is that the because you are going to do the electrophoresis the protein band is going to start migrating uh, from the gel block. So, you can imagine that even if I have a protein block into the gel block and if I put the electrophoresis which means I am going to put the negative on top and positive onto the bottom this protein band which is negatively charged because it has the bound SDS is start going to migrating and after some time the protein is going to come out into the solution. So, it will migrate and then eventually is going to fall into the extra uh, outside buffer and then what you do is you just collect the uh, uh, outside buffer and that outside buffer is going to have the proteins whereas the gel slice is going to be present inside the dialysis bag and then from the here you can be able to just concentrate and collect the antigens. So, this is very very simple procedure and this is very easy to perform and it is uh, very very uh, uh, you know so it is very routinely being used to isolate the antigens which are very difficult to over express or which are not soluble or uh, or other kind of conditions what we have discussed. So, to uh, explain you this procedure more in details I would like to take you to my laboratory and then I will show you a demo 
where we are going to perform these steps and so that it will become more easy for you to follow these steps in your laboratory and you will be able to isolate the antigens under the denaturating conditions. Uh, in today uh, we are going to give you a demo about the electro elution. So electro elution is a technique through which you can be able to isolate the antigen from uh, SDS page. So you can see this is a typical SDS page through which you, we are interested to isolate this particular band. Uh, I, in ideal situations uh, you are supposed to not stain these gels but uh, since we are just showing it for the demo purposes uh, we are going to show you with this particular gel. So before you start the experiment for the electro -elutions, what you require is you require a SDS page where you might have resolved your sample or the protein. Uh, you require the uh, blade so that you will be able to cut the uh, your protein of your interest. Then you require a dialysis membrane. Uh, you require a beaker full of water. And then you also require the rubber bands so that you can be able to tie up the dialysis membrane. So uh, let's start the uh, this uh, gel uh, elution, uh, electro elution experiments. So uh, in the step one, what we have to do is we have to first uh, see that the what is the uh, band what you have to isolate. So for that purpose, uh, what you have to do is you have to uh, first check the protein, uh, the site of the protein or the antigen where the site is present. So for example, in this, I have iso we have run the purified protein, and this is the major band what we have to isolate. So what you have to do is you have to uh, you know cut this particular region of that SDS page so what you can do is simply go with the lane for example if I want to run uh, isolate this particular uh, protein band so what I'll do is I'll just first cut the uh, SDS page from the side like this and then I can just cut from the top and the bottom and then your uh, you can be able to remove this particular gel block and that should be good enough for eluting this particular protein or this particular antigen. Uh, if you are interested to isolate the protein for a very very large concentrations, then in that case what you can do is you can simply merge all these wells and you can run a very uh, large quantity of the protein. So once you have uh, uh, cut the block and you now your block is ready for the electro elutions. Then the, in the second step what you have to do is you have to prepare your dialysis membrane. So this is a typical dialysis membrane what we use in the laboratories. So what you see is it is a, actually a plastic kind of uh, thing. So it is not a plastic but it is look like as. So it has two folds actually or the two membrane, uh, two slips actually. But they are you know stick to each other. So before you start what you have to do is you have to just cut the dialysis membrane. And what you can see is that it is actually stick to each other. So the both the uh, you know ends are stick to each other. So to get this dialysis membrane to be uh, work in a working condition, what you have to do is you have to put this dialysis membrane into a beaker, and then you fill this beaker with a water. And then you just put this into a microwave so that it will get warm up. So while uh, this is this dialysis membrane is going to be warm up, what happened is that the two sheets of the this particular dialysis uh, bag is actually going to be removed from each other because when the water is going to boil it is actually going to remove the surfaces what is being used to adhere these two uh, membranes and as a result it is actually going to give you a bag in which you can be able to place your uh, dialysis uh, your, your SDS, the band that we have just cut from the SDS page and then we can be able to do the electro -elutions.
So now what you see is that I have boiled the dialysis membrane and now dialysis membrane is uh, you know all the both the layer of the dialysis membrane is being removed. Now what you can see is that the bag is ready for putting the uh, you know the membrane or this uh, SDS block. So what you can do is you can simply open this and then you place this uh, block inside the membrane uh, inside this bag very carefully so that you should not damage the protein and once this is being put inside then what you can do is you can just put the uh, the rubber band from both the ends so you can just put the rubber band on this side and you have to be very careful that it should not be you know leaky or should not cause any problem so when you put the rubber band on one side and then you put the rubber band on the other side and in between what you can do is you can just simply fill a small amount of the buffer into this so that your protein will be in the water instead of and uh, by doing so you can also check that there is no leakage actually and uh, because if there will be a leakage the protein is going to come out from here instead of going uh, via the electroelutions so you can just add you know one or two ml of your buffer and that should be good enough and then you can do is what you can do you can close it from the top as well with the next rubber so uh, if you if you are uh, want you can even use the uh, you know you can use the dialysis clips as well uh, so that you know but if you can use even the thread as well so the purpose is only you know the you can just close this so that uh, you know you can make a bag like this now you can see that the you know band is inside okay and what i'll do is now what you have to do is you have to just submerge this into a, a horizontal gel apparatus okay fill it with the buffer and it doesn't matter what buffer you use but it should be conductive so that the current should flow and then what you can do is you can just close this and connect it to the uh, cathode and anode so you connect to the black and the red okay and now you just run it on a 100 volt uh, so you can just run it on a 80 to 100 volt and what you see is now that the electrophoresis is going on and when the electrophoresis will be going on what will happen is that this protein band is actually going to start traveling into this particular SDS page so because we have cut the SDS page at this end the protein band will run into this direction but after this actually there is no gel actually so what happens is the protein is actually going to fall outside the gel and because outside we have already covered it with the dialysis membrane so it will actually fall into that particular liquid what is present into the dialysis membrane and now your protein or the antigen is going to be present into the that particular solutions so now we are going to continue with this electro elution or this uh, uh, electrophoresis for at least for another uh, one or two hours and then we are going to see whether there will be uh, you know electro elutions or not and then after that what we are going to do we are going to remove the we are going to remove the rubber bands we are going to open the dialysis membrane from one end we are going to collect the supernatant and then you can just concentrate that supernatant and it is actually going to give you the protein of your interest so this is all the uh, few steps what you have to do if you want to do the electro elutions to isolate the antigen in a large quantity under the denaturating conditions from uh, SDS page for, produ for the production of antibodies so I hope you might have understood all the steps and it could be helpful for you to advance your work. With this demo, I hope you might have learned how to electro elute the protein bands from the gel slice and you will be able to utilize this uh, uh, demo to extend your work or to perform the additional experiments related to this. Now let us move on to the next uh, aspect. So once you have prepared the end or produced the antigen in the large quantity, then you have to prepare the antigens for the injections. So the preparation of the antigen for the injections, what you are going to do is you are going to combine the 100 microliter of antigen where you are going to have the 100 to 150 micrograms of protein with 
an equal amount of fluids incomplete uh, fluids complete adjuvant to a final volume of 200 microliter what you have to do is you have to take the 100 microliter of the antigen and 100 microliter of the fluids adjuvant and you have to take the fluids complete adjuvants then it is actually going to be 200 microliter and these 200 microliter you have to mix thoroughly to obtain a emulsion using a syringe or the pipette so once you mix them the fluids adjuvant actually contains the uh, the detergent and it actually contains the oil and it also contains the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell wall so fluids adjuvant is actually going to stimulate the immune response and it is actually going to activate the system so that the system is ready to take up the antigen but the uh, the uh, since you are making the emulsions where the oil and the water is going to mix together and because of that the antigen is going to be trapped into the small vesicles so what happen is when you take the oil and you mix it with the water it is actually going to make the emulsions where your antigen is going to be trapped within this emulsion so because of that the antigen is going to be released very slowly from the site of action and that is the purpose by for which you are actually producing this uh, this emulsion so that uh, it, the antigen should be keep immunizing your animals for a very very long time because what happen is the anti if the antigen is going to be cleared from the site of your injection very soon then you are not going to challenge the uh, the animal for a very very long time so so that antigenic response will not go to the very large chunk of the b cell or t cell it was going to spread to very small uh, population of the b cell and t cell and because of that the overall immune response is going to be very very less and why we are adding the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell wall because the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell wall is very immunogenic so when you inject the primary injections where you have the uh, the uh, the fluids adjuvant and which actually contains the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell wall the cell wall is actually going to activate the system so that the large amount of the immune machinery is going to be present at the site of injections after 4 weeks of your first injection which means the primary injections you inject the first booster dose so in the booster dose what you are going to do is you are going to again prepare the antigen in the same way except that this time you are going to use the incomplete adjuvant instead of the complete adjuvant so in the first round you are going to use the 100 microliter of your antigen and 100 microliter of fluids complete adjuvant whereas when you are going to do the booster injections you are going to use the 100 microliter of antigens and 100 microliter of the fluids incomplete adjuvants what is mean by the fluids incomplete adjuvant is that the fluids incomplete adjuvant does not contains the mycobacterium tuberculosis because now after 4 weeks the machinery is already been under activated state the site of your antigen action uh, uh, injections is already is having the lot of cellular machineries so now what you do is you replace the antigen uh, the mycobacterium antigen and you inject your own antigens against which the immune response is now going to be developed so as a result in the secondary injections the antibodies are going to be developed against your own uh, antigen now repeat the booster injections four to five times after every four weeks to generate a robust immune response and a development of the memory b cells which are actually going to generate the antibodies now what you have to do is before you do the injections you have to you do some procedures so in vivo immunization of rabbits before immunizations take out 5 to 10 ml of the the rabbit blood from the rabbit before first injections and that is called as the pre bleed which means you are going to take out the uh, blood from the uh, mouse or the rabbit 
and that is called as the pre bleed incubate the sample at 4 degree at 30 degree 30 minutes and allow the blood to clot centrifuge the sample at 7000 g for 10 minutes and you can be able to collect the serum and store it at minus 20 and this serum what you are going to collect before immunization is called as the pre immune serum the pre immune serum is actually going to tell you the level of antibodies which are already been present in the rabbit which means before the immunization which means the antibodies which are being present in the rabbit against other antigens not the antigen of your interest after this the whatever the injections you have prepared either in the complete adjuvant or the incomplete adjuvant into the rabbit which is the nz serine nz strain which is the new zealand strain so and during this step either use a helper to hold the rabbit or use a restrained device to hold the rabbit so you have to uh, you know you have to uh, hold the rabbits very strongly so that you will be able to inject the uh, the emulsions uh, either the primary injections or the secondary injections so you have the two choices either you ask someone to help you and hold the rabbits or you can use the restraint devices where you have to just keep the rabbits and then rabbit will not be able to move and then you will be able to inject inject the antigen on the back side of the rabbit in the form of the button which means if you if this is the rabbit you have to inject somewhere on the back side of the river uh, the uh, rabbit because this is the site where you have enough space and enough uh, area which so that it will be not be a problem and then you have to inject it in the form of button which means you have to inject at one side make it a button like this and then you go to some other side you inject then you go to other side so all these are called as buttons actually and that actually is required because the antigen is now going to you know release from these buttons on a very very slow mode and as a result it is actually going to cause the robust immune response and the large production of antibodies now once your primary injection is over then you can do a booster injections the procedure is almost the same except that you are going to uh, use the incomplete adjuvant versus the complete adjuvants once you are done with the booster injections then you can determine the antibody titer what is mean by titer is the amount or the level of antibodies against the antigen of your interest so in that case you take out the 5 to 10 ml of rabbit blood from the ear of ear vein of the rabbit incubate the samples at 4 degree and then you collect the serum and uh, you determine the antibody by a indirect ELISA so indirect ELISA anyway we are going to discuss in a later module when we are going to take up the uh, te uh, te techniques related to the immunology so that time we are going to discuss about the indirect ELISA and we are also going to show you how to perform the indirect ELISA as well after that once you are sure that the antibody titer is very high uh, you can be able to collect the blood and prepare and you can prepare the serum so for that you take out 20 to 30 ml of the rabbit blood from the ear vein or the large quantity of blood can be drawn after the cardiac puncture so you can have the two choices either you draw the blood from the ear vein which is actually not going to be a terminal procedure but if you are looking for a very large quantity and you are sure that the experiment is now been over and you don't need any more antibodies then you can be able to collect the blood from the cardiac puncture which means you can just uh, make a hole into the uh, into the heart and that's how you can be able to collect very large quantity of the blood from the rabbit but that is a terminal procedure after that it is the rabbit is not going to survive and he is going to die irrespective of the locations then you have to incubate the sample at 4 degree for 30 minutes and allow the blood to clot the centrifuge the sample at 7000 g for 10 minutes and then you can be able to collect because once you collect the blood and you allow them to uh, clot so once the blood is going to be uh, go for the clotting reactions you are going to get two fractions one fraction where you are going to get the blood cells uh, which is actually going to form the clot and the second place where you are going to get the liquid part which means that is the 
serum. So that is the yellow color serum you are going to get after the clotting reactions. Now, once you have produced the antibodies into the rabbit and as we have discussed all the theoretical aspect related to this particular technique, I thought of you know showing you how to produce the antibodies uh, in a uh, when you go to uh, at the animals or when you go to an animal house and try to do yourself. So for this purpose I went to the uh, Central Drug Research Institute and then I took the help of the institute because uh, we do not have uh, you know the animal house. So, that is how we have taken the help of the other institutes and I went there and then I have while they because they were doing this immunization and the antibody production uh, steps. So, I got the chance and then I actually made a demo video so that where the uh, the scientists are actually explaining each and every step what we have discussed so just now and that actually is going to helpful for you to understand how the antibody is being produced inside the lab inside the animal house and how you can be able to immunize the animals and I hope that the demo video what is going to be helpful for you to understand the practical aspect of the antibody generation as well. I am Amog Aran Sasdukite. I work in CSIR, CDR, I don't know. And in today's demo, uh, we will be discussing different steps involved in generation of antibodies in rabbits. So, uh, for the first step, we require several things like trans complete adjuvant, there it is from sigma. We need a microemulsifying needle which has two openings connected with a fine needle. We need antigen which is purified and filtered so there are no contaminations. It is a sterile solution of antigen. Then we take out some of the France complete adjuvant in Nipenda and then mix them together. Since one since the this adjuvant is oil based it does not mix easily with the watery system like the antigen is in previous. So, therefore, we mix them rigorously, rigorously and forcefully. For that purpose, we take these two, we mix this emulsion and uh, we, we, we mix this PBS and PBS containing antigen and the adjuvant, oil based adjuvant. After mixing them, we take out in a needle, using a needle, we take out in a syringe like this and then we fix the microemulsifying needles into it, attach another syringe into it like this. So, once you once you have filled your antigen and the, uh, the uh, adjuvant in this needle, you push it here and then you keep pushing from one side, keep pulling from another side, keep pushing from one side and keep pulling from another side. So, this process forcefully pushes your material, I mean the oil and the antigen through this fine needle and with that in that process the emulsion is formed. Emulsion can be called as water in oil or oil in water because both are in the same concentration, same volumes. So, you can call them anyway. So, it is, it is the emulsion, uh, by this method the emulsion is formed. So, for ready reference we have already prepared uh, the emulsion. This emulsion looks like white. Initially it was two phase and then slowly it has turned into single phase. Now you can push this emulsion from one needle to another side and from another this syringe to another syringe. So this process creates very good emulsion which does not separate out later on when you are ready to ready to inject. So how do you check them? 
So for checking purposes, we drop one of this emulsion, uh, drop a drop of emulsion on the water surface like this. If emulsion is not formed perfectly, this will spread out. Otherwise, it will not spread. So this is a check that your emulsion is formed correctly. So once you find that this drop is not spreading, your emulsion is actually ready for injection. So this was the process by which you prepare the emulsion for injection. So this is the first step of preparing the emulsion. So now let us understand why we prepare the emulsion. We have checked that the emulsion is formed. Now the purpose of making the emulsion because you have antigen and antigen through antigen you can raise antibodies but after emulsifying them you actually make the antigen releases slowly so it is a sustained release kind of preparation so that the antigen is exposed to system uh, in a systematic manner so that the more and more memory cells can be is generated and that's the sole purpose of having emulsion otherwise if you inject antigen as such in PBS or in other water system, it will be spread out in the body and it will be cleared up by the immune system readily and no memory cells will be generated. So these are, this is the purpose, main purpose of preparing the emulsion. So now we have uh, prepared the emulsion, we have come to animal house. This is our budget which will be immunized and uh, before immunization we have to take uh, pre immune bleed so that we can compare data. Uh, the serum and the anti serum. So we will now start how uh, we immunize it. So now we are uh, preparing to immunize. The first and important thing is uh, in all these animal processes is we have to avoid the pain to the animal. So uh, for that purpose, we strain, we have to strain the animal because we have to inject. So we uh, strain. Uh, the animal in a way that it has less and less pain and the movement is also less. So we inject this into the emulsion into the thigh. So to catch hold of both the legs and we have to sterilize the area using alcohol. We have to look at the thigh muscles. They should be cleaner, cleanly visible. The skin should be cleanly visible. There are two kind of uh, injection uh, that we give. One is intradermal and another one is subcutaneous. So today uh, we will be doing subcutaneous injection. This is our emulsion that we have prepared by microemulsifying needle we have seen right here. This is the area where we would like to inject. We have to take out all the airs from the syringe and the needle. Taken out, clean the area again, and then we apply some anti septic powder. Here it is betadine powder so that the infection cannot develop later on. We sprinkle some of it at the area of injection. And then slowly release, leave the animal relaxed and it is immunized. Now, to strain the animal in a towel or a, a 
or uh, this kind of flow. So the advantage of having this flow uh, to stream is if uh, the animal has its claw inside, outside of this flow, and then it cannot move. So we have to restrict the movement when it's in the in the stream and in the on, on this claw. So we use this bridge. Now we will strain the animal on this block and keep the animal relaxed on this block. Then I will strain it. So make sure that the ear are outside. And the animal is trained properly so as to reduce its movement and now it is ready to bleed. We will bleed the animal from this mid ear vein and we rub it so that it gets weakened up and the circulation is faster. The vein is also expand and more and more flow will be there. So this is the method which is normally we apply. When the vein is properly visible, this is the mid air vein from which we will lift. We will slightly sterilize it using alcohol and using a 20 dash needle which is wide enough to give sufficient bleed, we will pick the vein and collect the bleed. Then we to stop it, we just with less and less pain, we can collect the bit like this. Now we have to make sure that no further bleeding uh, occurs. Then we we'll wipe out whatever bleed is outside. Using sterile water, we wipe out all the blood here and there if, if any is finished. We will keep, we will wipe out all over using water so that the, the vein becomes cool and gets sun. We just check, still it is bleeding, so we keep, keep it pushed. Until the bleeding stops. So now, uh, now I think the blood has stopped coming out and then now we apply some antibiotic here in this case it is betadine powder so that there is no further uh, infections or inflammation in the rabbit and this also ensures that there is this is your pinna and uh, if there is any inflammation it will have some pain so it will, it will avoid that kind of pain also so we have 
the isolated approximately 10 to 12 mg of blood. This will give us uh, approximately half of the volume of the blood uh, the serum. Uh, this, and this will be coagulated, blood will be coagulated at 37 centigrade for one hour and then it will be kept at 40 centigrade for overnight so that the cough blood is shrunken properly and the serum is maximally uh, taken out. And then we will absorb the serum, add some preservative like sodium azide and uh, keep it at minus 20 or minus 80 as per uh, the requirement. And then we will also taste simultaneously the uh, title of it and the specific of using ELISA test and the rest of the test is Now you can see this whole of the animal, thus this animal is I mean, really relaxed. It has, I think it has religious pain or a negligible pain. pain. And this is actually very important for handling when you handle pain. That uh, in whatever procedure you uh, go through with animal, animal should be ensured not to have pain. Maybe you can, if, if, if the procedure is painful, you understand it is a painful procedure, you anesthetize it. Since this procedure is not painful, we have not been anesthetized. So, that this is very important step to ensure that the animal has been pain. That should be relaxed. So, in the uh, whole of the process, I think you have, uh, uh, you have got to know all the steps of animal development in the rabbit, and uh, we have to be prepared in medicine. We injected the person, we isolated the blood after giving sufficient booster doses, and uh, and full of the process is in the uh, I think you have understood most of these processes and you like it. So, this demo video is probably be very helpful for you to understand the each and every aspect, aspect, especially the practical aspect related to the antibody productions. And then let us move on to the next aspect that is the coupling of the receptor. So, once you produce the receptor either by the recombinant DNA technology or to isolate the antigen uh, the receptor from the crude mixture using the conventional chromatography or you have produced the antibodies uh, by the uh, from the animals. Uh, you have to perform the coupling of these receptor to the matrix. So, in the coupling reactions, you have the three steps. One, you are going to first activate the matrix, then you are going to use the coupling reactions. You are going to do a coupling reactions with the help of the reactive groups present onto the ligands and then you have to deactivate the remaining active groups which are present on the matrix. Which means, first you have to take the matrix. You treat it with the chemical so that it is uh, going to be activated. So, you it is going to be activated which means you are going to develop some functional groups. Then you are going to add the proteins so, or the receptor whatever. So, you add going to be add the receptors. What will happen? It is actually going to take up all the receptors what you are going to add and that is going to be coupled but it actually has more number of functional group compared to the number of receptors what is going to be coupled onto this particular matrix. So, what you have to do is you have to inactivate these functional groups so that it should not take up additional molecules whatever is present in the crude mixture because if that happens then you are actually going to couple the two particular different types of molecules. One is receptor the other is the non-specific molecules. So, because of that you have to you have to block these sites or you have to block these groups some way so that it should not bring the additional protein molecules or additional molecules to facilitate the non-specific binding of the uh, antigens or other kind of molecules because if that happens the affinity chromatography will not going to be very very specific. So, there are multiple ways in which you can be able to couple the uh, receptor to the matrix. The first method is the epichlorohydrin mediated receptor coupling. So, epichlorohydrin activates the polysaccharide matrix by adding the auxerin group with a 3 carbon alcohol group spacer arm. So, what you have is you have the polysaccharide matrix, then you incubate it with the epichlorohydrin and that actually is going to generate 
the activated matrix and this activated matrix is having the auxiliary group. Now what you do is you add the receptor which contains the primary amine which means the protein which is actually going to contain the NH group. Okay. Now the receptors are coupled to the matrix by a thioester or the secondary amine linkage. It can be able to couple the hydroxyl group containing receptor molecule as well by a ether linkage. So you have two options either you use the uh, receptor which contains the OH or you can use the receptor which contains the primary amines or the uh, primary amines or the secondary amines and that actually is going to couple to the matrix which means you are going to get the coupling of the receptor to the matrix and then ultimately once your coupling is over then you can add the large quantity of the glycine because the glycine is also having the amine groups. So glycine is going to uh, inactivate all the uh, activated group which are present onto the matrix which means all these groups are going to be blocked by the glycine and that is how you will be able to inactivate all the functional groups and that is how you will uh, going to avoid the non-specific binding. The second is the carbamoid mediated receptor coupling. So in the carbamoid recep mediated receptor coupling, the carbamoid reacts with the matrix containing the carboxyl group to form the isourea ester. The activated matrix is then allowed to react with the receptor molecule containing carboxyl or the free amino group. Receptors are coupled to the matrix by the secondary amine linkage, which means the, you take the polysaccharide matrix which means you can take the dextran or saccharide matrix you which is actually going to contain the uh, carboxyl group and then you add the carbamide. The carbamide is going to activate and generate the isourea esters and then if you have the primary amine, the primary amine is going to react to this uh, carbonyl group and that is that is how it is actually going to form the amide linkage and that is how the your receptor is going to be uh, coupled to the matrix and this is going to be released from or the dialkyl urea is going to be released from the matrix. Now this after this is done again here also you are going to incubate the matrix with the large quantity of glycine to inactivate the additional functional groups. Now let us discuss about the operation of uh, affinity chromatography and how and what are the different steps are present. So operation of a affinity chromatography. The first step is the equilibration. Affinity chromatography material is packed in a column and equilibrate with a buffer containing high salt which means around the 0.5 molar NaCl to reduce the non-specific interaction of a protein with the analyte. So if you remember compared to all other techniques the affinity chromatography is the only technique where you are going to have the very high salt concentration so that you should not uh, you should avoid the uh, interaction of the analytes to the matrix uh, by the non specific interaction because the matrix is also made up of, of sugar so it also can provide the functional groups which where the protein other protein may also can interact by the isoelectric uh, interactions or hydrophobic interactions or even some other kind of non-specific interactions. So to avoid that you have to keep very high con salt concentration so that the ionic interactions and the Van der Waal interactions or hydrogen bonding, uh, mild hydrogen bonding should not take place. Then what you have to do is you have to do a sample preparations. The sample is prepared in the mobile phase and it should be free of suspended particles to avoid the clogging of the column. The most recommended method to apply the sample is to inject the sample with a syringe. So the first thing is you are going to generate the affinity column which means you are going to produce the matrix then you couple it with the help of the coupling reactions. Then you are going to equilibrate and apply the samples. So once you apply the samples your antigen is going to bind to these receptors whereas the all other um, antigens which are present in the uh, 
uh, in the uh, in the sample will not going to bind and when you do the washing steps they are going to be washed away so the third step is the washing so in the washing step you are going to flow the buffer which contains very high salt concentrations and as a result the non specific proteins which are uh, or non specific analytes are not going to bind so that's how it is actually going to remove all those proteins and then you are going to do the elutions so in the affinity chromatography there are many ways to elute uh, analyte from the affinity column the first is that you increase the concentration of the counter ligand which means you can be able to increase uh, the antigens in a very very high quantity so you, if you do that the antibody will switch to the antigen instead of binding to your receptor or binding to the your uh, analyte and as a result the analyte is going to be released the second is you can change the ph or the polarity of the mobile phase uh, if you do so then also you are actually going to disrupt the salt bridge interactions and hydrogen bonding and van der waal interactions and that's how it is actually also going to affect the interaction or the affinity of the receptor to the ligands then you also can use the detergents or the chiotropic salt to partially denature the receptor to reduce the affinity to the bound ligands so the third is that you can use some denaturating conditions for example you can use the detergents or the chiotropic salt chiotropic salt means you can use the gonadinium hydrochloride Uh, which is actually a denaturating agent so if you put the gonadinium hydrochloride it is actually going to denature the proteinaceous receptor or the ligand and as a result it is actually going to eventually because the receptor or the ligand if they will not be able to maintain the three dimensional conformations they are actually going to lose the affinity for the counterparts and as a result the analyte which is binding to the matrix with the help of that particular receptor is going to be released from the column but this third method is not very much recommended because eventually the if you uh, if you go with the third method it is actually going to give you the antigen or the analytes in a denatured state the, the fourth is the column regeneration once you are done with the chromatography then you are going to do a column regeneration so after the elution of the analytes the affinity chromatography requires a regeneration steps to use for the next time the column is washed with the 6 molar urea or gonadinium hydrochloride to remove all non specifically bound protein the column is then equilibrated with the mobile phase to regenerate the column the column can be stored at 4 degree in the presence of 20% alcohol or which is containing the 0.05% sodium azide so once you are done with the washing step then you can just put the counter ion or counter lip uh, ligands and that actually is going to be compete uh, for the bound ligand and as a result the ligand is going to be eluted from the column so far we have discussed about the bioaffinity chromatography or we have just discussed about how to generate the receptors to prepare a affinity chromatography column and very briefly we also have discussed about the generic steps what is present or what is being used uh, to run the affinity chromatography now in the subsequent lecture we are also going to take up the few specific examples from the bioaffinity chromatography or the pseudo affinity chromatography and then we have also going to discuss how to perform these chromatography techniques and Uh, how you can be able to exploit the affinity chromatography to solve the specific experimental questions so with this i would like to conclude our lecture here